or waiting for Nick, uh, Paul, we're going to put out an offer letter for an administrator tomorrow. And probably in two weeks, we'll have another admin. The SANS Institute is the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit SANS.org to explore the full curriculum and latest training offerings. Tenable Network Security, creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center CV, the continuous monitoring solution. For more information, visit them on the web at tenable.com. Onapsys, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud Elegancy risks. Chocolate. Visit them on the web at onapsis.com. <laughs> Welcome back to Security Weekly, where quiet on the set means the opposite of what <laughs> you might think. <laughs> John. <laughs> We're back with the fabulous John Strand. John, welcome to the show. Hey. Hey. It's nice it's uh nice to hear your voice, John. Well, at Even least now we I'm not trying to have a conversation to with a recording of you, Paul. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so John, we're gonna talk about pen testing. Yay! Yay! Woo I'm getting an echo from someone. I don't know. Do you hear that echo? Yeah, somebody's uh, somebody's got a speaker. They're, yeah. they're trying to go through. In okay, I think it's gone now. There we go. Um, so, John, I got five questions on pen testing that I thought we'd hit okay. kind of quick. Some we've talked about before. <coughs> some we haven't. So, John, I, what too, would pick Rob Lee and Eric Cole and ask Grabby Ga Grabby. There you go. Yeah, that's, a good, that's a good team. Um, so, John, what can you do to prepare to receive a penetration test? So we have a bunch of videos that we've done over the past three years, uh, pen test preparations, and it's designed exactly for this question. Um, and I think we have three of them now. Uh, yep, first they're on our YouTube is, channel, actually. Yep, they're on our YouTube channel. And, and I want to explain why we put them out there here in a little bit, but there's one I'm preparing for a web application pen test. Fire up tools like Z Attack Proxy and Nikto against your web application to at least get the basic level vulnerabilities out of the way. Uh, so that would be for web apps. And then there's pen test preparations for an internal pivot test, uh, enabling firewalls, trying to use app logger, trying to set up segmentation. And then we have for pen test preparations, external network assessment. And that's basically at a bare minimum, before you get a pen test, you should probably run Nessus against the outside of your environment and address those vulnerabilities. Uh, it's really embarrassing for anybody at BHIS whenever we test a company and they're like, you know, you have 08067 on the outside of your network. You probably should have fixed that almost a decade ago. Nah. And you should get these basic things out of the way. And, and the reason why we, we go through a lot of effort to try to tell people how to prepare for a pen test, be it a web application pen test, internal pivot, or a network penetration test, is we don't want to spend a lot of time documenting easy-to-find vulnerabilities like cross-site scripting or basic SQL injection or command injection or 08067 or a Tomcat server that's exposed with default credentials. We really want to focus on the hard things. And honestly, that's what you want to pay a pen testing company to do. You want them to focus on the things that you can't do. So we're really working hard anytime we do an assessment it's right in our proposal it's like before we even get there do these things um, and it's going to be a much better test and to be honest it's been working great we have much 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 better customers whenever we finally get into the phase of testing here, Jeff here here okay good, <laughs> That's good. Um, so question two how can you make the most of your penetration testing results so Paul sent me this picture um, and, and I think before you even get to results, it has to do with scope when you get there. Mm -hmm. It's the most interesting man in the world. And it says, I don't always get a pen test. But when I do, I give them loose rules of engagement and wide scope. Uh, don't restrict your penetration tester. Uh, you don't want to be in a situation where you have thousands of systems and say, well, we're just going to test these two because they're representative samples. That's not true. Uh, it's not true of your network. You want your testers to be able to move around and try to attack as many different components and parts of, uh, of, of your network as possible. Uh, you don't want them to try to hack you like, that's on, like it's on TV. You don't want them to try to hack your firewall. Uh, you want to let them do what they do and breathe more or less organically. But whenever you get to the report, the report should really be broken down to where you have an executive summary, you have technical information in the findings. And the big thing for us, uh, and this is the secret sauce for BHIS, is we have an insanely detailed methodology. 
we don't just simply say we use p-test or OWASP or NIST. We actually walk through step by step what we did, uh, what worked, what did not work, what was our mindset, why, why would we try something? And it, it, those parts of our reports, you get to th see how we're thinking about your organization. And that helps out a lot to try to understand the results and how we came to the conclusions we did. That's it. That's what we refer to, John, as the attack narrative. The attack narrative. And you know, I, I was at the, uh, the SANS pen test uh, summit or the HackFest summit, yep. and I, I talked at a great length about how many things I've stolen from Engardians <laughs> as far as concepts <laughs> over the years. And how, you know, in, in many ways, BHIS is an offshoot of Engardians because we have people like Mike Poor and we have people like uh, Ed Scotus and Josh Wright who have kind of drilled these concepts of narrative and importance of the business value into everything that we do. Be it still at Engardians today or Counterhack Challenges or BHIS or Secure Ideas or Utilisec. Um, you, you know, it, it, or, or, these are all the different security firms that came out of that methodology. And it's not easy to do, but the customers like it a lot better than just getting a bunch of reports or output from an automated scanning tool. John, what scenarios are not being pen tested today that present the most risk for organizations? See, okay, now this, this kind of pisses me off. And, and the reason why it pisses me off is because Verizon comes out with a report and they say within that report, they say, I've got 99 problems, but mobile apps aren't one. Um, and that <laughs> rages me. And the, and the reason why, and I see where they came from. They're like, well, we don't see these attacks, but these things being attacked very often today. So we don't think it's an issue. As soon as that came out, we had a number of proposals that were on the table to do mobile device security assessments and mobile app assessments. And a bunch of those customers said, well, Verizon said this isn't important, so we're going to take that off the scope list. Yep. And, and that's so, terrifying. John, I want yeah. to add, I wanna add fuel to that fire. <clears throat> I'm going okay. to talk about something that I've never talked about on the show before. Um, I'm not certain I necessarily so, am authorized to talk about it, but I'm going to say it anyway because it relates to your comments. Close up and drum roll, everybody. The, I have uh, a bone to pick with the Verizon data breach report as well. They mm -hmm. list the top 10 CVEs that represent 96% of the vulnerabilities that they discovered. Mm -hmm. I have not, and I've tested five, I have not yet found a vulnerability scanner that can cover those CVEs. They are really? obscure. They are, I don't think, based in reality. Really? I don't think based and, in reality. And it didn't necessarily line up. We just did a, a webcast earlier this week mm -hmm. uh, about what we've, what we're seeing in our pen tests. And those CVEs are not huge in our I pen tests. I spend a lot of time step. looking at CVEs. And uh, those CVEs, I think, are randomly generated is one theory. <laughs> I, I, I don't <laughs> think they're, they're not based in reality. So I think uh, it was a typo. To be yeah, honest, I, I just I think, think they screwed up. They should have proofread. I've spoken to people who spend a lot more time with CVEs than I do. Let's just say that. And they came to the same conclusions that I have. To so further okay, back now, up now, my story. Now, just to, just to kind of back up where we're coming from, too, there could be people that could say, Paul, I think that they could, they could say this. They could say, well, well, John and Paul only use Nessus. Um, and that's nope. not true. Nope. Um, no, like I said, it is, goes beyond... It goes Just beyond the company we work for. Those CVEs are not represented at all anywhere. Anywhere. And in addition to that, and this might shock some people, but Paul knows this. At BHIS, we have multiple vulnerability assessment scanners, and the reason why is we have some customers that require us to use certain scanners. We have to use them. And uh, running this across multiple different scanners, I see the same results that Paul's talking about with these CVEs um, as well. So, so, so I, I don't the, know but then Verizon came. also, uh, and not to pick on Verizon, I, I hate picking on companies. I really do because I don't, I, I don't think it really helps anyone except in this case where it kind of does. That when you read this report, there's like this huge grain of salt <laughs> that you need to have because there's just inconsistencies, and mobile is one of them, John. Well, and I and, and I think what they meant to say and what they should have said is that mobile is not an issue yet. 
Uh, they tried to make it something really kind of flamboyant, like I got 99 problems, but a bitch ain't one. <laughs> and they're trying to be hip and cool because if you boil right down to it, the Verizon data breach report is saying the exact same crap that it said for the past four years. They're just trying to put a different word template on it and come up with different ways to make it snazzier and snappier. Um, so yeah, they have to try to make that stuff exciting. But in doing so, uh, they, they really, really have forced a lot of organizations, not really forced, but led a lot of organizations astray whenever it comes to because a lot of the, uh, the, the, the vulnerabilities that we have discovered at BHIS over the past couple of years that would lead us to actually change our underwear relatively rapidly are in the mobile space. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of mobile applications have almost no security based around them at all. And uh, it's like they forgot everything that they learned um, in basics of security and what they've been doing for the past 10 years. And they're like, well, we don't need any anti-C-surf protection. We don't need to have any cross-site cross scripting protection whatsoever. SQL injection, to hell with that. No one's going to try to type apostrophe or one equals one semicolon dash dash with their thumbs. Who does that? And they ignore it. And these issues, I think, eventually are going to come to the front, and it's going to be a massive, massive scramble in the industry for people but to start John, testing this well, collapse. Some of the vulnerabilities well, also get, stem add, from the API, add, right? The API, and essentially, which is a component of the web application that's using to yeah. serve these applications, web, uh, mobile applications, is oftentimes insecure. Joff, I don't know if that's where you were going, but you've said that. Yeah, that's, that's kind of where I was going. I mean, if I could, if yeah. I could add something to what John was saying, uh, one of the things that we've seen in some of the tests uh, is the blended threats, uh, the crossover between the the mobile applications uh, to the to the more heavyweight uh, web apps, where you know you you end up in, injecting things like stored cross site scripting uh, through the API that affects the web the web app side of the yep. application. So so there's this whole blended approach going on. And the other the other thing I was going to comment on is um, is the whole uh, concept of data leakage on on the mobile side. Um, it's not massive breaches that are going on. It's mm -hmm. like death by a thousand cuts. Yep. It's micro breaches that are happening. But, and uh, nobody's paying attention to that. I mean, is it possible? I, I've got a couple of thoughts. Is it possible, one, that uh, they're not focused on the mobile apps because the belief, right or wrong, is it only affects one person at a time? And so, therefore, it's just kind of not worth the effort. You know, not not taking into account that, you know, they've got a million users that are vulnerable to the same thing. So maybe it's a scalability issue. Um, my other thought is, you know, Verizon's only reporting on their customers, and they might think it's a representative sampling of all the companies out there. I doubt if that's really the case. I'm going to jump to Verizon's defense on this, on the second part, because I think it is. Okay. Um, I really do think it is, because whenever we look at incident response and we look at all the companies that we talk to, uh, either associated with IONS or at BHIS or, or me as an instructor with the SANS Institute. From a breach perspective, it, it appears to me to be representative. And also remember, it's now no longer just Verizon. Verizon's now getting all kinds of feeds from all kinds of other organizations as well. So I believe that it's representative. I do agree with the first one, though. I, I, I think that the idea of trying to test mobile is not present in people's minds because we, as human beings, we only understand visceral risks. Uh, we have to see someone get compromised. Like, for example, Sony is a perfect example. Sony gets compromised, and all of a sudden, all of our customers really want to have internal command and control and pivot tests because that's what the bad guys did. They weren't that interested before Sony, but after Sony, every executive is ready to open up a checkbook and start writing it to test against that type of risk. There has not been yet... Uh, a massive, large-scale mobile app assessment or mobile app attack, where we're talking, you know, 100 million credit cards were exposed through the mobile API interface. As soon as that happens, just once, and it makes big news, then it's visceral. Then they understand it. They saw someone else touch the frying pan. It was hot, and then they're going to jump in and start trying to test their apps. So is it also possible, are they really saying in their report where they're not seeing mobile apps as an issue is because there's just so many other problems that the hackers are successful with before they even have to get to the mobile apps? There you go. And, and I think that that gets into the second thing, and, I, and that is a great point. I think that gets to the second thing that a lot of pen tests do not include today. 
Uh, a large number of pen tests are not testing human beings clicking on links and downloading apps. They just aren't. We have a number of them that we do, but a tremendous number of our customers, whenever we talk about social engineering, whenever we talk about a phishing campaign, a spear phishing campaign, they say no. And the reason why they say no is because they say, well, that we know that that's going to work. There's no reason to test that. Um, if you go back to the Verizon data breach report, something like uh, over two thirds or three, or I think it was three quarters of the incidents that they saw this year and up to 90 in previous years were attacks that were spear phishing in nature. And a lot of organizations don't want to test for it because they know that it's going to work, but they don't test it. And that really gets to the fault line between a pen test and a red team. And I think there needs to be a clear delineation between those two things moving forward. So I think on that point, I th and this might be a little bit of a tangent. So everybody acknowledges that, a, that that's a huge problem. Is the solution more pen testing that tests it and it proves it because everybody knows it works? Or is there some other way that the industry needs to approach trying to discourage everyone from clicking on links? I, I think that that's, I think that you're heading in the right direction, but I don't think the answer, it, in my opinion, is more pen testing. I think we need to test different things. Right. Um, one of I the agree. things that we do a lot of testing on is a pen test in reverse. Uh, basically give me a workstation and in that workstation we're going to make an assumption that it's been compromised. And then from a scientific angle and a scientific approach, we're going to put 13, 14, 15 different pieces of malware on that system so that we can tell you exactly what your AV is detecting and what it's not detecting. Mm -hmm. We're going to use 12, 13 different command and control channels off that box so that you will get a full gap analysis on what you're able to detect from a command and control perspective and what you're not able to detect. Because we're moving beyond just saying, well, are we vulnerable to people clicking and doing stupid things? Yes, we are. We all know that. And we're moving into the realm of saying, can we actually detect it whenever they are compromised? And I think that that's kind of a new realm. Uh, a large amount of our business has actually been in that space lately, uh, the command and control testing. Can your AV detect certain types of malware? Does application whitelisting actually working? Um, can uh, can uh, uh, Carbon Black detect these types of malware? Can you detect an HTTPS, HTTP, DNS, IC? CMP, um, a quick protocol, all of these different types of protocol reverse command and control shells out of your environment. And that's finally starting to ask some of the right questions because now we're making an assumption that a user is going to be compromised and we're going to try to go about closing off the avenues for the bad guys to talk to that compromised computer system. So, so the answer to the question, what I'm hearing you say is it's really more, uh, another way of saying is that you're, you're really... Um, acting as the threat or the threat agent more and more in the pen test rather than it's just another way of discovering a bunch of vulnerabilities that like you said arguably should have been detected and, and taken care of before you even started the pen test but you know, agreed what, and at this point and at this point, you're starting to find, and it's not a sharp delineation, but you're starting to find that boundary between a pen test and a red team. And a red team is more where you're doing more threat emulation, and it's more of a kind of a black box attack against an organization with very few restrictions. And somewhere on the other side, and there's a big gray line in between, there's a penetration test. Where we're kind of running a vulnerability assessment and exploiting vulnerabilities to prove risks. We have to figure out where that delineation is now, and I think that that's important for the industry, but we need to find that that kind of fault line. I like and threat, threat actor. Threat yeah. actor. Well, that it, is nice. Yeah. That I, th I think that's a good t-shirt, like, I am the threat actor. I am the threat actor. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that is a, a design for a t-shirt next could year. Could be. Could be. But the uh, general consensus, not to get on off on a tangent, is that we should crowdsource the design for next year. Oh, that would be cool. I'm putting the oh, stipulation that, nice. that it has to include hack naked in some in some like there needs to be a hack naked design because we are Nipples. very much in tune with the hack naked so um, can i go off script and ask a question no damn it uh no, not until after we answer <laughs> the next question <laughs> then you can go off script i promise all right so john i'll have um, forgotten it but we then. talked we about ahead. how we can work to build a more effective pen test for byd byod environments that's pretty much what we were just talking about pretty much for we the most probably part skip it and i could probably go on yeah. my question Here's the point where Paul you, you loses even, control Paul, of the you show. Don't, you don't even run that would imply that you had control of it to begin and with. And I've promptly forgotten the question, so go ahead. Well, that happens when you get old, Jeff. We it understand does. that. It sucks. So hey, uh, hey, let, let's compare questions. So my question is, 
what will be pen testing in the future that organizations are just beginning to thinking about implementing today? In other words, like what technology is eminent, you know, a year to five years from now that people aren't even thinking about how we can effectively penetration test today? I, I think that all of our security fundamentals are about to undergo a radical shift. I, I think really? that- Wow, uh, that's pretty prolific, John. I think if you look at what we've had for security fundamentals for trying to secure an environment, it's been antivirus, firewall, IDS, maybe IPS for forever. And I think that what you're looking forward to into the next five to 10 years, and I, and I say this because, um, and I've talked about this many times in the past, a lot of our customers are listeners of Security Weekly and SANS, uh, mm -hmm. SANS students. Well, duh, of course they are. Um, but we're seeing a lot of those people that listen to the show. We're seeing a lot of people that have been through the classes starting to implement application app locker. They're implementing application whitelisting. They're putting in firewalls at the workstation level. They're segmenting out their networks. They're starting to do internet whitelisting. And I would like to think that in the next 12 to 24 months, we're going to see a lot of pen test firms <clears throat> really starting to struggle with pen tests in those environments. Um, eventually, some firms will get better than others, but we're seeing more and more customers that are reevaluating how they look at security and they're starting to implement those kind of key new security fundamentals moving forward. Um, but then you have in your notes, you mentioned doing pen tests in the cloud. And I honestly believe that that is going to become more and more of an issue because the cloud has been a catastrophic car wreck for security um, in this industry. That's a lot of alliteration. Um, it, it's just it's just bad. And, and the reason why it, it's a horrible, horrible disaster is because we then started looking at our services as though they were something that somebody else was responsible for. If I have my server up on Amazon, well, screw it. Amazon's responsible for it. Amazon isn't keeping your server up to date. They're not putting any security around it. Um, that's number one. Number two, whenever we're talking about software as a service, most of the tests that we have, we're testing vendors that are software as a service. That means they provide that service in the cloud. They have a communal portal where the customers log in, and then they can do something, like you know, email something about widgets. And there's you know, four million people that are using the service. The back end for those particular software as a service vendors is hideous. And in most situations, customers cannot get permission to actually test that service. We have yet to see any of our customers get authorization from a software as a service provider to test the software as a service. We have tested where the software of a service provider has asked us to come and test, mm -hmm. and it's, it, it's never gone well. Um, so, uh, so I think that we have to get better at that. I, you're I think that we have what to you're not, what but you're not I mentioning think the, is, go ahead, Jeff. what you're not mentioning is they also have small print in their SLAs that says, Oh, by the way, we're not really responsible for this, 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 and this, that has to yeah. do with oh, yeah. security. And, but, 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 but we don't want you to really know that we want you to think you're okay. The middle ground, and I'm not saying it's good, bad, or indifferent, right? They're, some of my hope is that these software as a service providers do give customers the ability to set their own configuration standards. Mm -hmm. So, sure. and there exists now. But I today, think most even today, of the companies though, that they're attracting and that are jumping on board don't have configuration standards. Don't want to think about ah, security. Well, that underlies uh, the problem. I, you know, yeah, I'll bring up those three letters. You know that you like me. Not no, that's to fine. Mention, you can say PCI. You know, yeah. PCI. You know, people are moving to the cloud because they think they're they're limiting scope by passing the buck to a third but, party. But I mean, let's take Salesforce as an example. And I'm okay. not picking on Salesforce. Well, they it could have sure fabulous. Sounds like you are, but go ahead. They can have fabulous security. That's fine. But right. when you have a Salesforce account, even when you have a Google Apps account, which which we have and I've administered for quite some time now, you have some configuration options. Which of those options are secure? Which one have I enabled two-factor authentication? You know, have I enabled force encryption? Have I enabled account auditing? Like, if someone logs in from a new system in Google Apps, but does I it send you a, a the message? The majority mm -hmm. of the customers they're signing up, when asked those questions, mm -hmm. would say, "What's that?" What's that? But you're, What's that? Agreed. You keep going right to the problem, and I appreciate that. <laughs> that's the problem, right? That's yeah, the problem. The, the pro but it's a problem that I think is, it's not solvable to the extent that you and John were talking about. There is still a problem. But I think that, like that middle ground that I was talking about is, like there are some options there that increase your chances of adopting software as a secure uh, service and keeping it 
more secure than if you do nothing, right? If you do sure. pay attention to the configuration options, you're going to fare much better than someone that's not. Well, maybe not. the cloud providers need to default to some higher level security that they think is well, the and base. that's the whole thing. That, but then the yes. customers complain because the, things it's aren't not working. usable. Yeah, it's that whole yeah. And no, I completely. I mean, well, Linux you, went through that thing 15 years ago or more, right? right? They what, what you get the a Linux issue, system the and there'd be all these services <laughs> enabled. Now there isn't. <laughs> Yes, I remember. You know, what, one of the on your, your Josh, Linux. Josh wants to say, yeah. Sorry, Jeff, go ahead. I'm trying to say something. One of the interesting twists for me, though, is um, a, as you, you test uh, some of these vendors, the, the potential impact is is so much larger because if we find a vulnerability and exploit it in the software and as, as a service uh, customer, nope, you're right. Um, we're not talking about you know one uh, you, one organization that's potentially mm -hmm. impacted. We're now talking about potentially tens, hundreds, maybe thousands of organizations. So. So the difference here is 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 dramatically amplified uh, in terms of of the uh, the impact, and uh, I don't know why I wanted to point that out. I just did because nobody said it. But um, no, it's a good point. Um, it, it also it also I think uh, explains a lot why the individual customers cannot get permission uh, to perform that test because the uh, the potential carryover um, uh, impact is just so huge that um, you know the business. Is 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 just their lawyers are just not going to let that happen, right? Um, so yeah. it's it's an interesting twist in the industry. So, um, and, and we should all listen to Joff because he actually gets to do the do the testing. Mm -hmm. I merely get to read his reports and sound smart. Nice. So. <laughs> actually, I only occasionally get to do the testing these days too. <laughs> yeah, no. he's you're turning more and more to a manager as well. So I remember, um, and a couple question. of other things. I remember my question is sort of, John sort of answered oh, yeah. it because I was going to ask. Okay, you know Black Hills. You guys are not the run-of-the-mill pen testing firm. You guys kind of, in my opinion, do it right. But there's thank you, Jeff. We there, love you, man. There's a lot of <laughs> pen testing firms out there that don't necessarily do it right for lack of clear guidance, for lack of compliance standards that stipulate what the pen test should be, and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And so I was going to ask, well, what about all the other guys? You know, wh what are they going to do to do real pen testing? But so, you touched on it that so they're going to struggle. I, 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 I really want to. I want really want to do a shout out to the firms that I I trust completely. Um, these are the firms that if I get hit by a bus and they decide to dissolve BHIS, these are the firms I would love to have people like Joff and Ethan and Bo and Carrie and Sally and everybody go work for. Uh, so if you're looking for good firms and you're confused, uh, check out Trusted Sec, trust out uh, Grim Security, tr uh, check out Secure uh, Secure Ideas, check out Counterhack, check out Inguardians. I mean, for the love of God, check out our Inguardians. Don't Google. Larry Pesci naked in Guardians because that might bring up some nasty things. But these these are firms that I stop. trust completely. Um, so there's three trends, and I'm going to answer your question. It's a little bit longer of an answer. There's three trends that I'm watching very closely. The first trend that I'm watching is uh, the pen test puppy mills. They're ravenous. Um, they usually underbid BHIS by 75%. Um, just just on a given proposal, if it's an open RFP, and the, the puppy mills arrive. The customer will ask me, well, these guys are 25% of your total cost. Why? And by and large, we, we, we're, we're pretty lucky in those situations. But when we lose those proposals, they usually come back and they hire uh, an Inguardians or they hire a trusted sec or they hire somebody good. Uh, there, there's just a lot of them. And eventually, it's going to cannibalize itself. There's just so many of them standing up so quickly. With venture capital money, they're going to go away. And that's a good thing. The second trend that, that we didn't get a chance to talk about here, but I'm going to throw a shout out to Katie, um, and I think it's Hacker One, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that's going to kind of step on pen testing are bug bounty programs. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of fantastic freelance hackers out there that are now getting work. They're starting to work with bug bounty programs, and they can make like you know three thousand dollars a day, uh, just kind of randomly trying to attack websites and sharing those vulnerabilities. So yeah, that's, that's a big deal, right? Um, and the final thing is automation. Uh, there's a firm belief that pen testing uh, can be automated. And there's a number of products out there that seek and claim to automate penetration testing. I don't believe that that's the case. But no we see a lot of those things. No gnoming way. Nope. No gnoming way. No gnoming way. That's the Nickerson 40-year horizon comment is what that is. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what? Nickerson might be right. Um, as much, as much as I hate to agree with that guy, no, uh, Nickerson, <laughs> you know, 
Look, when Nickerson says something, he's going to say it in the most uh, kind of inflammatory, caustic, abrasive way possible, but it sticks with you. And if he said it in a nice kind of calm way, a lot of those things would probably be ignored. So absolutely, you know, I think that automation is needed. to me is in the same category as the, the pen test firms that essentially run Nessus and slap a cover page on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah and, and, and and you know what? That's fine. It's I, even and, better and, and when I, they use the Nessus home feed to do that. <laughs> oh my God! I love, sorry. I, yeah, I, you know, I'm track. I'm completely okay with the industry. Um, I think John was about to say this anyway, but um, yeah. you know, turning that into a cloud service, that's fine. That's not what we do at BHIS, and I, you know, I'm I'm okay with that. Um, the puppy yeah, and, mills and, may not be okay with that. <laughs> and, and Joff, and Joff, we've been very lucky, right? We don't have a sales team other than like Paul. Um, we don't. We <laughs> don't. Have he doesn't even Paul. get paid for that shit. <laughs> I'm, uh, well, I'm, we I'm, say, I'm, I'm sales and marketing. Just sales to put and it out marketing. there. Say, don't and, don't and degrade sexy. my role. I'm sales and marketing. Sexy Thank you very much. Poster boy. <laughs> um, but but to be perfectly honest, <laughs> um, you know, I, we've been lucky. I talked to a lot of other firms. That, that are pen test puppy mills. And there's a lot of testers out there that are outstanding. And they're like, look, this week I'm working on six pen tests. Uh, I, I can't do this anymore. And they're trying to get out. They're trying to find good firms. And by and large, we try to find homes for these people, uh, for these errant puppies that, that are looking for homes. We try to, we try to take care of them. Um, we, whenever we get a proposal from a customer, they usually know who we are. They know what we do. And there's not a lot of confusion um, about about, about what we bring to the table. But there's a lot of firms where they have to sit down and they have to listen to a CEO or a CFO say, well, I need you to uh, hack my BlackBerry and then I will finally pay you. Um, it kind of becomes this kind of like dancing monkey boy uh, pen test. We don't deal with that crap. Um, we don't deal with people that want to know, well, what's your price per IP address? Good God, what a horrible question that is. Uh, we, don't, we don't deal with that. So there's a lot of times run away, run away. That, when well, I hear that so question, there's, it there's reminds the type of me company Monty, Monty, run away. Will, will hire those other versions of what we call pen or what they call pen testing, and you guys don't really want them as a customer <laughs> anyway. No, oh, and and you know what the sad thing is, uh, kind of kind of riffing off of that, uh, there's just not a lot. There's not enough good firms out there. Um, there just isn't. Uh, I know that Dave Kennedy, I talked to him earlier this week, he's turning, he, he can't do any more work the rest of this year. Mm -hmm. Of course, now like a sales team, he'll be like, you shut up, we can absolutely take more. No. It's funny you mentioned Dave because he really wanted to come on the show for this segment. I reached out to him last minute <laughs> and he said, the only reason I can't make it is because I will be on an airplane when you're doing that segment. He's like, otherwise oh, I would. Oh, so uh, look for and, Dave to come on. I guess they don't have Wi-Fi. We, we'd love to, we'd yeah. love to talk to Dave. <laughs> Can well, they say no streaming. They say, like, I don't, uh, can you, you know, make I a just... Skype call from an airplane? Not a good yeah, idea, right? Not, like, it's no, generally no. frowned upon. Especially talking about hacking the Internet of Things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah, I think there was a, I think there was an English guy that did that. Man on a plane. <laughs> got himself in trouble. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I, I'm okay with it. I'm, an, I'm in a good place with what's happening to the industry. Um, a lot of people have dire consequences, and they talk about whoa and all kinds of horrible things that are going to happen. I think it's going to be what it's going to be. It's going to do what it's going to do. And I think that the quality firms, kind of the ones that I mentioned at the beginning of the segment, they're going to be fine. Um, and, and that's okay. I, I think that everything's going to be okay eventually. I think that PCI is moving in the right direction. Uh, PCI 3.0, actually clarifying what a pen test is, was a movement in the right direction. I, I think that things are going to get better, but we're still going to have lots of people that don't know the basics and the fundamentals. And that's a, really the responsibility of everybody that's listening to the show to go out there to try to educate people into what the basics and fundamentals are. And don't be a dick whenever you do it. No, uh, don't that's good. I think that's good life advice uh, is don't be a dick. Don't and I want to thank you, that's everyone. Good life for, advice. Thank you, everyone, for talking for about this subject. I think we want to uh, – we're going to take a short I, break now. I'm, yeah. no, I do it. I do it. But I'm trying to keep us on time here, Jeff. For those, but this is important. For those that read the PCI pen testing methodology, it's important to note that they stopped short of disallowing automated pen testing. They don't say that you can't do it. So mm -hmm. don't think you're doing okay if you're getting an automated pen test for PCI. Hire John. Well, thank that, was, you. that was a good point. Or Larry, Larry. please, yeah. please, please. Or Larry. Please, we got to spread the love around. Yes. Hire Larry and in Guardians are Hire fantastic. Hire a good pen tester, not an automated pen We're going to take a short break right now and come back and talk about, I mean, the news story for this week is very interesting. It's about the potential person who created Bitcoin uh, is the major story. We're probably going to 
probably going to spend a lot of time talking about that and some other news stories as well. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Boom. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Nick, let us know. Let me know when you're not streaming. <laughs>